35 on Smith Valley. It's that big building and there's like a yellow pillar and it looks like a dome and it's an all glass front. It's an office building where they lease out uh, office suites to people, all right? The point being is it very avant-garde looking, very futuristic. It doesn't conform to a true style, but the fact is it is sufficiently unique enough that that style actually creates demand. Another example would be the Stutz uh, office building downtown. Anybody seen the Stutz office building? Used to be a warehouse, now it's an office building. I actually had an office in there for about five years. It was always full and a waiting list because it was very unique. So the conformity can go two different ways. Something can be sufficiently non-conforming that it creates a new style or a desire and have increased rates, all right? Principle of contribution we talked about, this is the sum is greater than the whole or greater than the parts. Adding things could change it. Sometimes adding things might detract above ground pool. I think the book mentions a bowling alley. I don't know anybody's got a bowling alley in their house. I'm sure somebody does, but um, that could. There's a term on there called highest and best use. This is probably the number one thing the appraiser looks at when he appraises property. It's the highest and best use. What's the best use for this property? Now, you cannot just carte blanche across the board say, well, commercial's always better. No, that's not true. In the house I'm in, commercial is not better. It is at the end of a dead end street in the woods. The highest and best use for my property is residential. So they do have to take in consideration things like zoning and lot size. You can't just say, oh, well, commercial is worth more. That's not always true. On page 314 is increasing and diminishing returns. This, my friends, is my second favorite story in the whole book. All right. True story. And you know it's a true story when people always go, true story. I listed a house up at 56th in um, Kessler, Pike Township. Two ladies lived in the house. In their front yard, they had 72 lawn ornaments. All right, they had the gazing ball, they had the little mushrooms, they had the little dude, the lady bending over where you could see her bloomers. They used to brag that they never mowed the front lawn. They could just weed whack between everything and take care of it, all right? So on our first week of showing, I get a call from a guy. He said, Raymond, I'm gonna show your property. I'm like, okay, now remember this is dated. I said, okay, I'm gonna leave my fax machine on over the weekend to accept your offer. That was my little cool statement I always thought would work. He said, okay. So Monday I call him, I'm like, hey dude, didn't get an offer. He's like, well, to be honest with you, we pulled into the driveway, saw the front yard, guessed what the house was going to look like and never went in. I'm like, okay. So I go over to the house and I knock on the door. I'm like, hey, Mary, can I come in? She's like, yeah. I said, hey, all of these things in the front yard have to be out of the yard. She's like, but we love them. I get it, but it's too much. And she said, okay. That weekend, I get a call and said, Raymond, we're going to show you property. I said, okay, fax machine's on. Send me an offer. About 25 minutes later, I get a call back from this guy. He's like, Raymond, have you been inside your listing? Now, you know you're in trouble when another agent asks you if you've been inside your own listing. He's like, you may want to go talk to your clients. So I go over there, knock on the door. I'm like, hey, Mary, can I come in? She's like, yeah, come on in. I go in the house. Inside of the house, 72 lawn ornaments in the house. 
the gazing ball was like on the centerpiece of the kitchen table. The mushrooms were by the fireplace. And I'm like, Mary. And she said, well, you told us to take them out of the yard. Uh, you got me on that one, didn't you? I said, it's too much. It's got to go. At some point, too much is too much and can actually reduce the value. I went with them. We went over to Target, bought some of those big storage bins. I literally helped them put this stuff in the storage bins. We labeled them, stuck them in the garage. Next weekend, we got a full price offer, closed the house. All right. That is the law of diminishing return. At some point, too much is too much. And this is what I was leading up to when I was talking about rehabbing your kitchen. You get 70 or 80 cents on the dollar, but you just keep doing stuff. At some point, it's going to start detracting value because too much is too much. I had a buyer. We walked through a house with a buyer. You guys know what a Hummel is? The Hummels, those little figurines that are about this tall, like angels and things like that. This lady must have had, I kid you not, three, four hundred Hummels in her house. Everywhere. On the mantelpiece, in the lead, window ledge, in her kitchen, on her nightstand. It was way too much. All right. So at some point, too much will start detracting value under the law of diminishing returns, all right? The next one in your book is called plottage. Plottage. You got know what subdivision is, right? Subdividing, you take 100 acres and you divide it into 100 one-acre lots, and then you sell the one-acre lots, and the total is more money than you paid for the 100 acres. That's the typical subdivision that we talk about. Plottage is the inverse of this. This is where you buy two small lots and you push them together and the value of the one big lot is worth more than the value of the two smaller lots added together. Plottage or assemblage. This happens a lot in the inner cities when they start regentrifying or rehabbing a neighborhood. You may get somebody that buys a house on the corner. They buy the house next to it. They demo both houses, push them together, sell that to a convenience store or a gas station, and that land is worth more than the price of the two houses they paid for them. All right. That is called plottage. It's the inverse of subdivision. Two lots made into one, and the value of the one is greater because of the size and location and zoning than the two lots put together. Are we good? Thumbs up? A couple more here. Regression and progression. Regression is backwards. This is where a large house is sitting amongst smaller houses. So the value of the large house has regressed compared to what it would be if it was sitting amongst similar houses. I was a victim of regression. When I got divorced from my wife, there was a house that went up for sale in the same neighborhood and I bought it so my children could be close. They could ride the same school bus, have the same friends. But it was Davis's largest home, four bedrooms, three baths on a cul-de-sac. The other four houses in the cul-de-sac were all single story houses. So the value of that bigger house was probably brought down by the other smaller houses around it. Then if that house would have been sitting somewhere else with the same size houses, that's regression. Progression up is just the opposite. This is where a smaller house sits in amongst bigger houses 
So the value of that small house has progressed upwards compared to what it should have been if it was sitting amongst the same size, similar houses. So progression up, regression down. Okay. The principle of substitution. The principle of substitution says if there was a house that sold for, make up a number, 150, and I'm going to list a house that would substitute for that house, most probably then my price is going to be what? 150 under the principle of substitution. This, my friends, is the basis for the sales comparison approach or the comps that we are getting ready to talk about. The sales comparison approach is solely based on the principle of substitution. One house will substitute for another. And we're going to go in depth in it here in just a minute. All right. And then obviously the last thing that can affect value is supply and demand. So what you have are 11 factors that can affect the value of a property. They can affect it and they can work individually or in concert with each other. You could have two or three of these things going on at the same time. Cameron? I was gonna say, so in supply and demand, say you have like the only house in the neighborhood available to sell. Would that bring your house value up? Since yes. like, you're the only house in the neighborhood selling right now? Yeah, happens a lot. Say you're on a really exclusive neighborhood like I don't know, crooked stick golf course, and there's only one house. That house will probably go at a premium because there are many number of people that want to live on a golf course, and there's only one of them. Now, contrast that with some anomaly happens and every house goes for sale on the golf course at the same time. You see how that supply and demand could be affected. If every house was for sale, that would also affect the property. It could bring them down because now there are multiple buyers and sell or buyers that they can choose. So right? it's not and that goes going to be unique to anymore. Do what? It, your house wouldn't be unique anymore if it was yeah. everyone selling around you. Well, if, if, so the supply and demand would come in. Now you've got demand, but you've got a large supply because every house is for sale. And that would affect the value of the property. That is how this whole system works. So there are plenty of people that have said things like, oh, I don't want to list my house right now because there may be five houses in the neighborhood. I want to wait for several reasons. One is I want to want them to close because if they get a high value, I can use that as a comp. And two is like you were pointing out, I don't want to compete with seven other houses in the neighborhood to try and sell my property. So that is a very good analogy of how supply and demand can affect the value of a property. All right, so are we good on those? Thumbs up. Because what I want to do now is calculate value. We have been talking about this word called value. We have talked about some of the principles that change it. So now I want to show you how properties actually, or an appraiser actually gains value or determines the value of a property. There are three methods to do this. The first method is called the sales comparison approach. In your book, I want you to write the words existing homes. The sales comparison approach works really well when the homes have a history like our MLS system that we can look at to determine historical sales. This is probably 99% of all the CMAs you will ever do in your career are based upon the sales comparison approach. And when you do that, there are certain things that you have to substitute for. 
So 